your time and talk to you about some work we've been doing with the Introductory Astronomy Laboratory course. Um, introductory Astronomy at many universities is a large lecture course taught with 80, 150, 300, in one case, um, my previous life lesson, uh, about 600 students at a time. Um, and so we were trying to figure out how did we develop a laboratory course that really focuses on students doing astronomy, thinking about astronomy in terms of, in terms of a verb. And this was really in response to a lot of the workshops we were doing working with faculty around the country, trying to understand what can we do to be best supportive of people that are teaching astronomy classes, because there aren't many astronomers teaching astronomy classes. Astronomy courses are taught by physicists, mathematicians, geographers, and occasionally astronomers, but not often. So the question was, how do we help them? But what they were telling us was that when the students take the astronomy classes, they don't necessarily want to turn them into astronomers, but rather what they'd like them to do is understand something about the beauty of, of the universe, understand something about the nature of science. So we endeavored to try to figure out how to do that. Now, it turns out astronomy instructors aren't crazy. There are other people who believe this is true. The National Academies believe that, it's this, that we, we should be encouraging students to know something about astronomy, but to actually engage in the practice of doing science, to engage in scientific discourse, and to engage in the idea, ideas of creating scientific ideas. So, how have we been doing this? Well, I've been teaching introductory astronomy for quite a few years, um, and I've done a lot of lecturing about the scientific method, really great lectures, enthusiastic with great jokes and cleverly illustrated lectures. That hasn't worked out quite so well. We've done a lot of confirmation labs where we have students in modern day astronomy classes getting out pieces of cardboard and string and making, pick, making those pretty ellipses and doing it on graph paper so they can get Kepler's second law just right. That hasn't been working out very well. Uh, we've had them try to do science fair experiments where we say, hey, we've got telescopes, we've got CCDs, go out there and study anything you want. And that's been a complete disaster. And you can also see from my appearance that hair pulling uh, is something we've tried. And again, these things just haven't worked out very well. And if we looked at cognitive science and things that we know from physics education research, we should have known they weren't going to work very well. First of all, as astronomers, we're experts in the field. We've spent our entire lives studying how science is done. And as experts, we know a lot more things than, than our students do. Because our students are novice learners. They don't see the same things in astronomy that we do. Um, it's not that they don't care, it's not, it's, though sometimes it seems like it. It's not that they don't want to learn astronomy, although sometimes it, doesn't seem, sometimes it seems like it. It just turns out that we ask them to do astronomy and learn astronomy and talk astronomy when they're non-science majors. We're really just asking them to do, to do too much at once. In other words, what we do, in the words of Tom Foster, is we exceed their cognitive load, load level. So how do we do that? What we've tried to do is to build laboratory experiences that scaffold the student experience. In other words, we provide them the support that they need to be able to experience doing astronomy. And we don't just set up this thing and then show them how to do astronomy and then yank them away from them completely. What we do is we purposely say, here's how you do astronomy, and we slowly start removing these scaffolds over the course of the term. Um, if you think about doing astronomy in terms of sort of a traditional view of what inquiry is, these are the three things we often think about. We want students to be engaged in questions. We want students to be designing strategies to pursue evidence. And then we want them to communicate their findings. And traditionally, we teach it to them in this order. Um, but what we find out when we begin to think about this is this asking the research question is the hardest part. Some of you have had the wonderful experience of, of grading and supervising um, uh, science fair projects at the local high school or middle school. And you can think about what a painful process that is sometimes when you see those, which paper towel is best or which volcano, model volcano is best. Because this asking a scientific question is a very, very difficult process. So in designing our astronomy labs, what we did is we reversed this process, completely flipped it on its head, and said, let's leave the hardest part, this asking scientific questions to last, and let's start with this idea of writing conclusions, then teach them how to design um, experiments, and finally teach them how to, to answer questions. So the schematic of what we're doing looks like this. In every single lab course, in every single, single lab setting, in every single, single lab section, which means for two hours, we do five different experiments. Not just one for the whole two hours, we do five short ones. And in the first one, we hold their hands. We provide a lot of scaffolding. We provide them the research question. We provide them the research strategy. We provide them the data. We provide them the conclusion. And then over the course of two hours, and every week we do this, over the course of two hours, we slowly remove these scaffolds. So by the end of that two hours, students are finally doing their own scientific inquiries, where they're asking their own questions. Um, Turns out this is a lot of fun to do because your tax dollars at work. NASA has put a lot of great resources and a lot of great data on the web. It's easy to access. 
Solar System Simulator is one of our favorite ones because it includes every image from every GPL mission um, to the solar system, all easy to access in a, in a the format that students can access. Um, we also use citizen science databases like Galaxy Zoo. Many of you are familiar with the millions of galaxies that are in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. We, there's a citizen science project that's put all these things together, easy to access for students. So we use these databases so students can actually do the same kind of astronomy that most astronomers do, and that's data mining, not actually running a telescope and looking at data that's already there. Um, in addition, we've put in a lot of the things that we know work from cognitive science. For example, a lot of metacognitive prompts. So after students classify things like galaxies, we say, stop. How did you do? Did you enjoy that? Could you figure that out? Are you comfortable with that? So we have a lot of places where we ask students to stop and reflect on what they're able to do so that they can see that they're having success in the context of the, of the science lab. And then what we also do at the end of the term is we have a science fair. And I said, made fun a little earlier about science fairs with paper towel projects and, and model volcanoes. But we do this in our introductory astronomy class where we have our students, sometimes 300 at a time, do a science fair presentation, much like the poster sessions we have here right at this conference, uh, where they present their data. Uh, here are some pictures of some of these students. Um, this is, um, and these are students in Wyoming. Right? So these are, are students that necessarily haven't been, they're not exactly worldly often, they're homogeneous from a demographic perspective, they often don't understand what science, why science is important to them, yet we have these students doing science and doing some really interesting science um, as well. These aren't science majors, they're, they're business majors, they're agricultural majors, they're economics majors, um, and some of them have a really, many of them have a really great time doing this because all of a sudden they're owning the science. They're actually having that experience. It's worked out better than we could have ever possibly imagined. Here's Bubba. It's one of my favorite guys here. From, you know, he just came in off, off the ranch there to, to study the different types of galaxy clusters that are out there. Very, very exciting stuff. Now, you might be curious, does it work? And the answer is yes, it works really well. We've used a single group, multiple measures, pre-test, post-test design with these students to try to understand the nature of, of how it's working with them. We've used two measures. One is the test of astronomy standards. This is an astronomy diagnostic test. It's a conceptual test. Really gnarly, really hard questions. You find student performance improves dramatically on these. We've also assessed their ability to do scientific inquiry. And we find that over the course of the term, when we're doing multiple measures, we find their ability to actually do scientific inquiry increases dramatically. Not traumatically, dramatically. Maybe traumatic in some other cases. <laughs> You're right about that. Um, at this point, we've had um, three dissertations that have been written on this set of materials. Dan Lyons has done some work on the views of scientific inquiry, the Bossy instrument, finding really interesting things about how students begin to understand the difference between data and evidence and the nature of how science is done across a number of fields. Uh, Kendra Syverson has done some very interesting work about how does this work when you have students working individually versus working in groups. Um, fascinating work for revealing that when students do this individually, they can do it, but what they do is they're not nearly as risky in the questions that they tend to ask. And some, um, some work by Brown on the views of nature of science, trying to understand that how students begin to think about science as a result of doing this process. We've got some national attention um, for this, um, and most recently this material has been published by W.H. Freeman. We have a great partnership with them who help us disseminate these materials at very low cost. And we even have an online discussion group. If you'd like to join us, please feel free to send a blank email to this address. I'll put the address up here again. Um, because there's a, a large movement of folks across all disciplines, astronomy, biology, chemistry, who are working on creating materials in this sort of format and having really, really good luck. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? How many labs do you have throughout the semester? Fifteen. Fifteen. One semester course. Then. One semester course. You know, it's just the entire universe, Don. Okay. We can cover that in 15 weeks, no problem. <laughs> He's got a lecture really fast. Is this a required course or an elective? It's an elective course for non-science majors. At the University of Wyoming, as with many institutions, introductory astronomy seems to be a very popular course for non-science majors. We teach about 35% of all undergraduates wow. in this course. So how come we have an N of 29? On uh, that particular study, mm, why was that an N of 29? <laughs> Seems like I, this data that I reported here was from a course for elementary majors, elementary education majors only. We repeated this in a number of other places. Though. Anybody else? Thank you. Thank you.